Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Pilgrim's Well. We're here for our third interview here at uh, Dr. Beaky. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the meditations or meditation uh, and the emphasis of that from the Puritans. Um, before we start, I think most of Christianity thinks about, uh, well, it's important to pray, it's important to read your Bible, and some uh, denominations might more emphasis, well, you got to study the Bible, uh, and perhaps in, in communion as well, and, and uh, of course, the, the Sunday services. Meditation is, I think, more heard outside of the church nowadays, and you know, Eastern types of meditation. So I think it's important that we start with, with a definition uh, about prayers and meditation. Would you uh, help us with that? In the Puritan mind, Paul, the difference between meditation of a Christian and meditation of some kind of mystical sect is that all meditation is tethered back to the Scripture. Mm. It's all within the fence of Scripture. So in the Puritan mind, meditation is another very, very important means of grace. And they would call it uh, a halfway house between Scripture reading and prayer. Hmm. So you, as I mentioned, I think on the last episode, you read Scripture, you meditate, and then you pray. And if you don't meditate, you see your prayers are going to end up just sounding so so similar. It's one reason why we actually uh, actually worked for five years on a... On a Family Worship Bible Guide, so which is also, by the way, for, for private worship, where we try to take the two or three major takeaways from each chapter and spell them out and then ask a question. Hmm. So you examine your own soul. And one of the in-between-the-lines purpose of that book is that we want Christians to be able to say it when they finish reading a chapter, okay, what are the main things of this chapter? What must I do with it? Yes. And how must I examine myself from it? And what must I implement? What must I change in my life? Mm. So this is a big part of the Puritan idea of meditation. For them, meditation was, when you first read it, it's like, wow, this is so complex. But actually, when you actually do it and you learn to get in the habit of it, it's, it's not all that complex. But they actually taught it was like six or seven steps. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it so sounds you, rather complicated. Yeah, it does. It does. But say, say this is how you would do it. They would say, so you, um, well, first of all, let me back up a minute. They believed in deliberate meditation and occasional meditation. Hmm. So deliberate meditation is connected. We would say today with your daily devotions, where you spend maybe five minutes. Sometimes they'd spend 10, maybe. They never did. They, you know, there's 41 books written by the Puritans on meditation. 41. And I, I got them all. <laughs> Only one is in print, and the other well, was in print. There, none are in print right now, but I got them all on Xerox sheets, and I made a thorough study of this actually one time. I spent most of the summer on it. And uh, so uh, deliberate meditation is, is usually twice a day, morning and night. Uh, with your daily devotion. They, by the way, their daily devotions was twice, twice a day. Um, and then occasional meditation is that type of thing we were talking about last time, you know, where those little darting prayers, but they would do that with things around them. They would spiritualize things around them. Mm-hmm. So they might, okay, let's say I'm sitting here 10 minutes before you come in for this interview. So, okay, I'm going to use this time wisely. I'm not just going to let my mind wander. Mm-hmm. I look over there, I see a door. I'm going to meditate on a door. Jesus said, I am the door. Hmm. And doors open and close. Jesus is the way to the Father. But a door also closes. I need to be very sure, oh, my soul, that um, I don't close my heart to God. How do I close my heart to God? I might meditate on that for a couple minutes. How do I open my heart to God? I might meditate on that for a few minutes. Hmm. And then I might meditate on the fact that there's no other there's no other doors to God other than Jesus. He's an exclusive door. Mm. And so they would take everything they learned. They said there's three books. Scripture is one book. Your memory and your conscience is another book. Mm. And then nature is another book. Mm. So they meditate on something. They would say, go to all three books and fill your mind with everything that you know about that subject. Mm. And then you go to prayer. Wow. Yeah. 
Uh, I think it's, uh, I was overwhelmed when I first read uh, Thomas Watson. And I, by that time, I knew that the Lord had called me to into the preaching ministry. And I read his uh, sermon and I thought, I don't know if I can ever preach. Uh, because every three sentences, he has an illustration or yeah. a, uh, sometimes every sentence, sometimes yeah. twice per sentence, he has two complete pictures within one sentence. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, how, how much sp- time does he spend? Over looking over his manuscript and it's just trying to come up with different illustrations. And then when I heard you speak on meditation, I was beginning to connect the dots. And I was thinking, this is not a time where he sits down and comes up with illustrations. This is a life of constantly bringing everything he sees together yeah. with, with the truths of God's word. Yeah. Um, and I, mean, I think he was especially gifted uh, in this. Yeah, way he as was. Well, he but, was. Yeah. So was Thomas Brooks. Yeah, certain Puritans, were, and, and of course, John Bunyan had the most fertile imagination of them all. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, they. so what they would do, Paul, is they would, they would then, let me just walk you through the process real, real quickly. So let's say, you know, you mentioned just a moment in private conversation ago, a moment ago, in his law doth he meditate day and night from Psalm 1 verse 2. For the Puritans, this was a major text in the Bible. Mm. This is our duty day and night to meditate on God. And um, so you, you, you cultivate as much time as you can doing that. So let's say you're reading Psalm 1 tonight. You would pick out a text like, like verse 2, and that would be the text that you meditate on. Mm. So you choose something. Then the next thing you would do is you'd spend a, mem- a moment memorizing verse 2. You'd say it over to, your, over to yourself six or seven times. And then you would go to prayer that your meditation would be fruitful. And then you start meditating on this verse. And you, you, you meditate in different ways. Everything you know about what it means to delight in the law of God. Then you would ask your, examine yourself, do I delight in the law of God? And then you would stir up your emotions. Oh, how love I thy law. I, I want to live according to God's law out of gratitude to God. Hmm. And the goal was to stir up your affections. Hmm. Stir up your affections of love and hope and joy in meditation, as the Puritans call it, to warm your heart. And um, if you could not achieve that in a given night, after five, ten minutes or so, and you couldn't couldn't get that warmth, you couldn't get a close connection with God, Hmm. you don't despair. You ask God to forgive you for your poor meditation today and ask him to help you more tomorrow. (laughs) That's how one Puritan puts it. But... When you do have that warmth, you see, in that communion with God, then you, you, um, you then start thinking about what kind of resolution should I make? Mm. That's the, the, the fifth or sixth step, resolution, mm. uh, that I should change. Mm. You know, think of Jonathan Edwards' resolutions when he was 13 years old. That came out of meditation. Yeah. So one of his resolutions was... As a 13-year-old, I will never waste five minutes in my entire life. I want to serve God all the time to the glory of God. <laughs> now, we look at that today and we say, oh, man, that sounds like a horrible life. You know, you can never chill. No, no, that's not the Puritan idea. Recreation, um, um, meditation, fellowship with others, uh, vacation now and then. All of these things are purposeful mm. to help you live to the glory of God. Mm. But they all have a purpose. Yeah. So you're never wasting five minutes. Going on a vacation to have mm. restorative energy is not wasting time. Yeah. But you're meditating mm. through every day. Yeah. So I call the Puritan doctrine of meditation, I call it the lost art. Mm. The lost means of grace today. We, mm. We're so busy, we don't have time to meditate. Wow. And when you're so busy that you don't meditate, the problem is... You lose depth. Mm. You end up skating along the surface. Mm. And the end result is the lay people are clamoring for the pastor to get their sermons down from 60 minutes down to 20. Yeah. And they can only just give a little exegesis and no application. And people walk away feeling good, say, I've, I've got a good sermon. But mm. they, the pastor hasn't taught them how to meditate. He hasn't taken them deep into the text. Yeah. He hasn't helped them mind the scriptures. He, he counsels on the side instead of counseling them from the pulpit. Mm. Mm-hmm. Puritans believe most counseling should be done from the pulpit. Mm-hmm. And not that you don't counsel people in, in special needs. But the point is, when you develop a meditative spirit, 
you tend to develop a deeper, deeper level of communion with God. Now, of course, as ministers, that's one of our advantages. We're forced every week, right, as we prepare <laughs> sermons, to really yeah. meditate on that text, mm-hmm. hopefully until the text masters us and we don't just master it. Yeah. And that's when we get the depth in preaching as well. Yeah. But you see, Puritans would always say this, a congregation seldom rises above the level of spirituality that their minister achieves. Yeah. Because the preaching is so important. If the preaching is shallow mm-hmm. and the minister isn't very meditative, doesn't reach much depth, the congregation won't. Yeah. So that's our task mm-hmm. with the help of the Holy Spirit to be meditators and bring out treasures, new and old, mm. to our people so that they learn from our preaching just instinctively how to meditate more and how to open a text more mm. and then how to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ by the grace of the Holy Spirit. So what you're saying between the lines is that the art of meditation is lost in the pulpits first, and as a result, it's, it's lost in general. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. But I, I won't say it's lost, of course, in, in a good number of pulpits. Sure. There are, sure. thanks be to God, there are a number of faithful preachers today. But in comparison. But in, but in comparison, yeah, yeah. The majority of the pulpits, I think we could safely say, is... The sermon lacks the kind of depth that the Puritans had because the preacher's not a meditator. Yeah. There's two thoughts that, that came to my mind as you were talking. Um, one of them is um, the, the idea of meditation, uh, constant meditation. It, it kind of fills in, uh, well, first of all, let me give you, start with this one. Um, it's almost an embodiment of the great commandment. The first commandment, to mm. love the Lord your God with all your heart, mm. soul, mind, and strength. The way that you describe meditation kind of touches all those aspects. Yeah. It's That's not right. just the mind, but then because you're meditating on it and because you're a living being, um, it becomes a practical reality and, and how to, uh, and it stirs your heart uh, as well as your mind. That's an uh, excellent point. Yeah, that's and, an excellent point. I think yeah. it's, uh, and the second thing is, um, I was thinking about this earlier and, and it's just refreshed now. Uh, I read a book a while ago. Uh, I actually wrote a paper on it uh, for one of the courses, and that was the, the book of Theodorus of Morocco. Mm. Um, and in that book, it's it's a conversation between the father and the son, and and the father's explaining uh, how uh, he he works, how he prays, and the son has all kinds of questions. And uh, and the book needs to be read with a, a bit of care, uh, perhaps. But one of the points that stood out was. Uh, and it was very recognizable. He says, well, at the beginning, I would pray in the morning and then the evening. But I would find uh, that it was such a long time in between that my heart was kind of cold when it came to the evening prayer that I needed to start. And then he says, well, then I had the afternoon. But then in the evening, um, you know, when I go to bed uh, and I would sleep for so long, uh, you know, six hours, seven hours, I would wake up and my heart was cold again. So he woke up in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think that's advisable for, for everyone, especially if you go on the road. Um, but the, the point was... Um, those times in between, if all your spiritual life is praying here in some Bible, reading here, and then at the end of the day, I think you have that. You're cold, and so it's almost like you need to restart a yeah, cold yeah. engine. So you need to be careful here not to make it a mechanical process. I mean, this is the problem with Islam. Five times a day they've got to pray, and, you know, and the... Um, uh, what's it, the bell or the... What do you, what, uh, what's the, the thing? Yeah, the, the man that, that says yeah, the prayer. Trumpets, and, yeah, trumpets. It. So they all go to pray instantly. But it can so easily then become a form. Yeah. So I think what Theodorus Bracco would say, if he's true to the Puritan tradition in the Dutch area, which I think he is, um, he would say that the way really to keep your heart stirred up is to have this occasional meditation throughout the day, mm-hmm. even if it's for one minute. Yeah. You know? And and then a, then a short prayer, yeah. and um, that that that's, I mean, so I'm driving over here today to talk to you, right? Mm. So I'm praying, Lord, help me, help, give me words to speak. Let this be edifying. Let this be a blessing to people. I'm stirring up my heart to have some warmth and affection for what I'm about to do. Yeah. Also, yeah, you see, so it's a state of readiness of mind to to live in the presence of God. So that's the Reformers and the Puritans. That yeah. They had that so much stronger than we do. Mm. Their motto was, in Deo, I'm always yes. in the face of God. 
Yeah. God is always present. God is always here. It's it's really a life under God in a constant direction mm-hmm. of, of following after God. I, I think about when when the Lord said that He can't whatever He says, He sees He does what the, He sees the Father doing. Yeah. I mean that that's to me that verse it's it's yeah. always a like a mountaintop where I want to keep climbing towards. Yeah. yeah. Right? The, the Lord when he walked on the earth, he was in constant fellowship with his father yeah. and he yeah. did so many things. That's right. And his whole life, his whole life, every moment was directed to do his father's will. Yeah. See, and that's what the Puritans strove for. Of course, we all come short here. Mm-hmm. But and once we understand as Christians that God is our father mm-hmm. and our purpose in life is to do his will, to glorify him. See, then, then if we're doing something just worldly, for example, or seeing sin on a screen, mm. but then we, we, just, we just want to walk away from it. We want to please God. Yeah. We want to please God. So what did the Puritans meditate about? This is an interesting thing. I want to just comment on this, sure. if I may. Because um, I went through all 41 of these books, and I took all their lists of med- subjects of meditation, mm-hmm. and I made a chart of them. Mm. And uh, a lot of them are just, you know, you meditate on the scripture that you memorize. But a lot of them are doctrinal. Mm-hmm. And I divide it into the six or seven sections of systematic theology. Mm-hmm. And guess what? The four most common subjects they meditate upon are what the Puritans often call the four last things. Mm-hmm. Death, mm-hmm. judgment, heaven, and hell. Oh. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> we are so time-bound. Yeah. You know, we're thinking always about, you know... Can I win this ball game tonight? Or can I, um, oh, I've got to go shopping. Or they're meditating on heaven, hell, death, and judgment. <laughs> yeah. And the next thing after that, that list of four was they meditated on Christ, yeah. his person, his work, his offices, mm-hmm. his states, his natures. Uh, so much more godly than what we're prone to be with all our busyness. Yeah, I think the we live in a time... Uh, and especially if, if people are watching uh, this and are thinking, you know, why do I need to meditate uh, and all those kind of things? We live in a time of, of junk food, uh, where junk food is popular. And, yeah. and I think that living your life without meditation is eating like junk food every day. Right? It's, it's, you go from here, you have a quick, exciting thought or something that uh, amuses you. In other words, your mind is turned oh. off. Um, mm. But what you get over time is you become unhealthy, uh, your mind becomes sloppy, you become tired, you start feeling sick. Um, but if you eat healthy foods, which in the beginning, it's not as appetizing because your your taste buds are uh, geared towards other kinds of food. But if you're, the more you do it, the closer, uh, the stronger you become, the more joyful you become and the more you love this, yeah. this new uh, diet. And I think for all these things in prayer and meditation uh, and even reading the Puritans, the beginning, uh, it's a little rough if you're used to, to McDonald's, so to speak, right? Yeah, if you're right. used to that, uh, fine culinary uh, science seems to be a, a strange diet. But once you get the taste, uh, you finally begin to realize what we're really made for. That's and right. I think at the end of the day, meditation is... Uh, in the things of God is the most natural thing to us yeah. because we were made for that. That's right. And it, that, that's all very good. That's a, a very good illustration. See, it's a Puritan illustration. But the, <laughs> Except uh, the McDonald's but, but all of this is designed, we must not forget, to keep our consciences sensitized yeah. and close to God. Mm. So the Puritans would say, I go back to that example of watching a movie, as soon as you would see um, somebody making an illicit Illusion mm. to maybe a relationship outside of marriage. Bam! Hit the hit 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 the, hit the shutdown button yeah. because you're desensitizing your conscience. So mm. even if you're a passive listener, they would say we commit sins by our silence, by what we yeah. allow ourselves to be party to. Mm-hmm. And so a meditative spirit on the things of God is meant to counteract the listlessness and the proneness of the old nature to mm. sin in our mind, and to discipline ourselves to think good thoughts, like Philippians 4, uh, what is it, 6, 7, and 8, mm-hmm. um, whenever things are pure and lovely and, and, and God-glorifying, think on these things. Yeah. 
meditate on these things. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. I think the um, the the giving it to God and the uh, especially the being silence, um, you know, silently passively doing sin. Uh, that's even in the old. Testament under the laws. Right. Right? If yep. you hear somebody say and you don't do anything about yep. it, how much more your TV, right? right? You don't have to stone anybody. Uh, just turn it off and, and don't come back. Right. Right. The, uh, don't put it on mute and say, well, hope, hopefully it doesn't come back a second time. Yeah. My mother was very resolute. Uh, she was always near the remote control. And if something would come on that she thought was, was wrong, it would be the off button, not another channel. That was it for the night. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> That's good. Uh, That's good. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for watching. Uh, Dr. Biki, thank you so much for uh, sharing these things. Um, what a gift and what a treasure that you've been given uh, through, your, through your parents, your father and his library, uh, and especially to the Lord. Yeah. of uh, opening your eyes to more of these things and be able to pass them on to others. So we want to thank you and uh, we pray for you. We also want you to pray uh, continuously for uh, the health and uh, the continued strength for Dr. Biki and his wonderful wife. And I think we can ask also for prayer for your son-in-law uh, at the beginning of his ministry. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I just had the privilege of ordaining him uh, into the ministry with ordination sermon in Picture Butte, Alberta, last week Friday. So... That was a very emotional experience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's, a, he's a dear, dear brother. So yeah. we're, we're, we're praying for him as well. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you so much. And we'll see you next time.